Welcome to the Most Days show. The mission of Most Days is to measurably increase quality of life globally by helping people change their habits. This show is devoted to understanding how change happens. We talk to authors, neuroscientists, psychologists, elite performers, and leaders to understand human psychology and the habits that transform lives. Today, we're speaking with William Porter, author of Alcohol Explained, his book that addresses the common misconceptions we have about alcohol. This topic is particularly interesting as alcohol is so highly regarded in our society and plays such a central role in so many of our social situations. However, many of the assumptions we make about alcohol are simply incorrect. We, we tell ourselves that it can help with sleep or that it's a good social lubricant or that it's, it takes the edge off after a tough day. But as William points out, these ideas are far from truth. He takes a methodical approach to dispelling the myths surrounding alcohol and providing clarity on what actually transpires in our bodies and minds when we consume it. Whether you're reevaluating or simply curious about your relationship with alcohol, today's conversation with William is enlightening. With his hyper-rational deconstruction, William demystifies what alcohol truly is and isn't. So regardless of your drinking habits or if you intend to change them, I think this, this episode can offer a fresh perspective. At most days, everything we do prioritizes the health and well-being of our members. In order to successfully achieve this, we rely on the financial support of members like you. A business model dependent on advertising or some other third party that is not our members distorts incentives and creates a conflict of interest between pleasing advertisers and serving members. That's why we refrain from calling our, mem our members users, a term commonly used in traditional social networks where advertisers are the actual customers and users are exploited to serve their interests. We unequivocally reject this business model as it contradicts our values and our operational principles. You can support what we're doing here by downloading the Most Days app, which is currently available on iOS and soon on Android. Most Days uses behavioral psychology and AI to help members change their habits to improve the quality of their mental and physical health. We have a flexible contribution system through which you can support us at the level that makes sense for you. While we suggest a recommended amount, lower contribution options are available for those unable to meet it. For individuals unable to contribute at all, we offer scholarships to ensure access is not hindered by financial constraints. To sustain our business, we rely on contributors opting for the recommended amount. Thank you so much for those who have contributed and everyone else for considering joining the Most Days community. Without further ado, here's the show. William Porter, welcome to the show. Hi, Brent. Thanks for inviting me. This topic is one that um, I've recently spent... Um, a little bit more time thinking about. So I think as some of our listeners will know, my, my I've spent a lot of time around addiction. I went to rehab myself in my early 20s. I was for a long time mostly familiar with the inpatient treatment and like the AA version of um, basically stopping drinking or moderating drinking. I mean, in that context, it's not really moderation. And then um, I, I saw an interview with this comedian, Nikki Glazer, who mentioned Alan Carr's book on, on, on quitting drinking, which to me is in this category of unwinding the brainwashing we have around alcohol. And it's in a different and much more rational approach than AA is. And then I read your book and I really liked it because it feels like a very contemporary version of that. Um, it feels... Like it's in that spirit and it's, it's in that category. You should correct us um, if, you, if you feel differently. But it's just, it's much more contemporary and it's updated and it's got, it's got a, 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 a different flavor to it. But in that category, I really love the category of, wait, let's understand what alcohol is and what addiction is and all of the misconceptions we have around it. And just understanding those things, I think, can help us change our relationship with it. So excited to dive in. Maybe before we do that, will you give us a little bit um, of your background and how you came to be the author, I should say, of, of, the, of Alcohol Explained? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, so I started drinking and smoking when I was about 14, I think, which I think these days probably feels very young. But back in the sort of the 80s, 90s, it was fairly sort of standard, particularly over here in the UK. And I funny you should mention Alan Carr, because I so, so I started smoking at 14. And I came across Alan Carr's book when I was 16 or 17. And I found it really, really interesting and exciting, because like you said, he, he brought this entirely new approach to sort of addiction if you like it was very much centered on smoking and nicotine but he just took this really rational approach to it 
which resonated with me. I read his drinking book and, and again, that all started to really meld with me. But I carried on, I stopped smoking, but I carried on drinking and I drank for sort of 25 years. I, I was always a binge drinker. So, so the idea, to, to me, the idea of having like one or two drinks was just bizarre. I couldn't see the point of it. I would always go out. We would always go out and get as drunk as we possibly could. And then I ended up in the military. And again, there was that very hard drinking culture. And I served out in Iraq. Um, and that very much accelerated my drinking. And when I left the military and went into sort of more normal employment, I still had those drinking habits with me and they were sort of escalating as I was going through life. And it, it was in my late thirties that things were really starting to become unstuck and my binges were getting more and um, longer and longer. And I was suffering more and more coming out the other side of them. And when, when I say I was binge drinking, what, what I would do is drink a lot, fall asleep, wake up in the middle of the night with insomnia, which drinkers do. Um, and then I would drink more alcohol to get back to sleep. And then I would wake up in the morning and I would drink again. So, so I would start drinking Thursday, Friday, drink through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, wake up feeling awful on Monday, ring in sick. And then of course, just carry on drinking again. So it was becoming more and more unmanageable. And that was, if in fact, so it was two, two, February 2014, I sort of crawled out of a five or six day binge feeling absolutely dreadful. My wife had left me, she'd taken the kids with her, I hadn't been into the work for the best part of a week. Um, and I just thought, I cannot keep doing this anymore. So that was me quitting. Um, and it was about a year after that, a year or so, maybe a bit less that I wrote Alcohol Explained. Um, so, so just the background to that is having, having come across Alan Carr very early on, I kind of taken that mindset and looking to understand the drug, in this case, alcohol, and sort of applied it throughout my drinking years. And was that kind of part of your process of stopping drinking? Like you, you dive really deep into, wait, why am I drinking the way that I am? What are all of the different mechanisms that are at work here? Because you write the book pretty quickly after, I, I don't know if you would use this term, but after like a rock bottom moment, mm. you know, you've, you've Absolutely. lost the family and you're not showing yeah. up at work. Was that, was it an important part of your process of changing your relationship with alcohol? Yeah, I think it was. So, to, so I, I, I was never a particularly sociable person. Um, and I found alcohol very important in social occasions. But as my drinking wore on, I'd find I, I, I was happy just sitting on my own drinking. So I would go out, have a few drinks with friends. And I just think, you know what, I just want to go home and sit on my own and drink. And, and so I spent an awful lot of time sitting on my own drinking and thinking about it, thinking why I was doing it. And when I woke up in the night, and I'd be thinking, well, hang on, why am I doing this? What what, how do I feel now? What does the drink make me feel like? So, so I was kind of analyzing it all the way through. When I came to quit drinking, I had a pretty good idea of the mechanics and a lot of the psychology behind what I was doing and why. But it was a period after that where I really started to learn a lot more about it. Um, and how it all fitted together. So I think, yeah, writing it was certainly very cathartic for me because, the, you know, the, you quite often hear people say, if you want to know a subject, teach it. I, I would say, if you want to know a subject, teach it or write about it. Because when you actually sit down to write about it, you realize that there's things missing, there's certain dots that need joining, you have to go back to the drawing board. So although I thought at the time I had a fairly good idea of it, when I actually came to set it all out in writing, it really helped me kind of complete the picture. You adhered to the approach that you recommend in the book. And what I like about your book, and if I'm remembering correctly, you know, Alan Carr's approach does the same thing. At the beginning of the book, it's like, hey, if you're a drinker and you want to stop drinking, but you're currently drinking, you don't need to stop right now. Like, try not to have too much while you're reading because you're not going to absorb, but like, no need to stop. I think Alan Carr's like very explicit, like, you won't drink by, by the end of this book, but you're drinking yeah. now. And I think maybe that's an oversimplification, but I think that's for somebody who is curious about changing their approach to something opening it up with like, Hey, you know, you don't need to stop immediately. You can consume this book and, 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 and kind of see what happens, but you do recommend, um, if you're going to be drinking and continue drinking, do it alone because then you can be more reflective and aware of like what is happening to you as you, as you consume the alcohol and as you kind of go through the, the cycle of 
drinking, not drinking, drinking again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's quite right. I mean, I think the, the reason for saying to people they don't need to stop while they're reading the book is it, it's very simple. It's, you know, if you've got something to do, you prepare and then you do it. So for me, reading the book is the preparation. You do that first and then you worry about the actual stopping afterwards. Um, so, so I sort of th think that's qu kind of quite useful. And also, yeah, what you've said, we have a lot, we, we, we put alcohol on a pedestal and it becomes responsible for the good times, the bad, everything. But what I think is important, a lot of the time when we drink, we tend to drink in pleasant situations anyway. So when we start drinking, we, we're drinking when we're in, you know, out with friends, which is enjoyable anyway. And then as our drinking progresses, we still tend to drink in enjoyable situations. So we work all day, we get home, we open the wine, we open a beer, whatever. That tends to be a pleasant situation anyway. And it's very easy to just take it at face value that alcohol is wonderful and it makes you feel great. But a lot of the time it's because we're doing it in these specific situations and it can be incredibly powerful to just stop for a minute and think, hang on, what is the great feeling I'm getting from this? So let, let's maybe let's jump into, I think it's a good segue into the like pleasure and anxiety cycle, um, which I think is very well laid out in terms of, and, and I think it, 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 it also will transition nicely into the cognitive um, cycle and why alcohol is addictive. And so I don't think you call it the pleasure anxiety cycle. I think that's the way that, that I think of it, but mm -hmm. can you describe that cycle a little bit, kind of the reason that we have the drink in the first place and then the corresponding anxiety and then how that kind of cycles on itself? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, and it's very simple. It's obviously alcohol is a drug um, and it's a sedative, a depressant. Um, and when I'm using the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. So that's why when you take an alcoholic drink, it makes you feel slightly dulled. If you're nervous when you have it, it can make you feel relaxed. It's that sedating effect. But of course, the human brain creates and excretes a huge array, array of chemicals, drugs and hormones that it creates itself. These are naturally occurring things, you, you know, you and your listeners would have heard of like a adrenaline, cortisol, endorphins, dopamine, all of this stuff that the brain creates and excretes. Now, there's a lot we humans don't understand about this process, but what we do know is the brain works by way of something called homeostasis, which is a fancy word for basically just a chemical balancing act. It's all of these chemicals, drugs, and hormones all balancing each other out. And if they do balance each other out, you generally feel like positive and quite resilient. Not to say you don't have bad days because everyone does. And, and of course, we're all different. Some people's positive and resilient is going to be slightly less than someone else's. But when your brain chemistry is, is in balance, it's how you feel at your best. Now, if you introduce alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain realizes that there's been a disturbance to that balance and it seeks to counter it. So it, it releases things like adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And what that does, it's trying to counter the sedating effects of the alcohol. I often think of it as, you, you know, the old fashioned bar weighing scales where you've got a bar and two baskets hanging on it. Imagine that's your brain chemistry. And on the one hand, you've got the sedatives, the things that make you feel sleepy and relaxed. And on the other hand, you've got the stimulants, the things that make you feel awake and alert. Imagine it's balancing out. Now, when you take alcohol, you dump a load into the sedative basket, so the balance gets tipped. So your brain counters that by stuffing a load into the stimulant basket. But of course, the problem then is when the alcohol wears off, that feeling of anxiety is left hanging on for a bit. So to go back to the basket analogy, you know, it's balanced. You put something in the depressant side the brain puts something in the stimulant side, but when the alcohol is released, it tips over towards the stimulant side. The short explanation is for every, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whatever sedating or dulling effect you get from alcohol, there's a corresponding feeling of anxiety when it wears off. Of course, the more you drink, the more your brain's countering the sedating effects and the worse you feel when you wear off. And this is why people wake up often three or four in the morning with their heart beating really fast, unable to get back to sleep. 
They might be absolutely exhausted, but it's the equivalent of drinking loads of strong coffee. They're overstimulated. They can't sleep even though they desperately need to because of that chemical imbalance. Now, it's not a pleasant feeling, okay? That that anxious feeling, you know, anxiety, that's a colloquial term people use for it, that anxious feeling you get when you're hungover. It's not a pleasant feeling, and there's two ways you can get rid of it. One is to wait a few days for your brain chemistry to get back to normal, but who wants to be miserable and tense for a few days because there's a much quicker way of doing it and that's to take another drink now when you take that other drink it's a wonderful feeling but it's no more than relieving the anxiety that the previous dose caused when it wore off I sometimes explain it to people imagine you're in a car and your goal is to drive at exactly 30 miles an hour Okay, it's a clear day, there's no wind, it's sunny, you've got a lovely flat road, no bends, and it's just a straight line. So you're just sat there with your foot very specifically depressed on the on the accelerator, you don't have to move it at all, you're just cruising along quite happily at 30 miles an hour. Now, if you suddenly go off the concrete road, and you go into gravel and mud and wet, your vehicle's going to slow down. So you have to push down much harder on the accelerator to get up to 30 miles an hour. Okay, but wait, if you then go off the mud and grass and gravel and back onto the dry road, your car's going to burst ahead out of all control. That's basically what happens when you stop drinking. So that's the, and, and that also that, that's the main pleasure that regular drink, drinkers, daily drinkers get from their glass of wine, their beer, their spirits, whatever it is. That wonderful feeling of relaxation they get from that first drink is no more than just relieving the unpleasant feeling that the previous doses caused. It seems so obvious when you explain it, but, but I don't think that it's obvious. It falls under this general category of there are no free lunches. I yeah. was trying to explain <laughs> to my, my daughter, she can get a little bit, she's more likely to get a little sad after she like has ice cream or something. And I was trying okay. to explain this to her and it reminded me a little bit of alcohol, which is, mm. hey, you're kind of like using up a little a bunch of happy and then there's not that much happy left in the tank and so all you've got left in the tank is some sad and so that's what happens yeah. and so we don't want to consume too much sugar sugar is nice but it's not very good for us and it reminded me i mean it's a very you know she's seven so it's very simple but with alcohol it's like you're using up a bunch of your happy and then there's no happy <laughs> left there's only sad left i mean it's you know, in this case, it's, it's same principle. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a similar principle. You know, it took me a long time to connect the waking up in the middle of the night. It's like, oh, I pass out, and then you wake up in the middle of the night, and your heart is racing, and you're just jacked, and you can't go back to sleep. But I like the gas pedal analogy. It's like you're in cruise control. If you press the brake, you know, while you're trying to maintain speed, then you're going to have to press the accelerator. And then what happens is, is when the brake pedal is no longer on, the alcohol wears off. Well, okay, then the then there's there's way too much, you know, gas um, mm. uh, kind of accelerating you. So will you talk about the reason that alcohol is addictive? I think you do a really good job of explaining the disconnect between when you drink and the negative consequences that there's a delay there and that that's what and that confuses the subconscious and that's what makes it addictive will you walk us through that yeah yeah so so the subconscious people talk a lot about the subconscious and they almost use it as a sort of cover all for anything that's going on in their brain they don't understand when i'm talking about the subconscious i'm talking about it in a very specific a very specific part of our brain and that's something that automates reactions Okay, so if you feed the same response into your body over and over again, it will trigger a reaction to it. The easiest way to explain it, I think, is for people who drive. So if you're a driver um, and you've been, so, 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 if you, so if you're a driver and you're traveling as a passenger in a car and the driver is driving too fast or too close to the vehicle in front, you know, you can find your right leg keeps tensing. They call it air braking. Obviously, there's no logical reason for it because there's no brake on the passenger side. But it's just that automated reaction. For however many hundreds of hours you've been driving, your brain, your subconscious has just absorbed that if you want to slow a vehicle down, you tense your right leg, you straighten your right leg. So as soon as you perceive that you're going too fast or too close to the vehicle in front, your brain is triggering that reaction. So the subconscious, if you do the same thing over and over again with the same result, when your brain thinks it wants that result, it will tri trigger that action. Now, with alcohol, 
as I've covered off already, every drink leaves a you know a, an unpleasant feeling that needs another drink to relieve. Now, over the years, your brain will start to link those two things together so that whenever you feel that uptight, anxious feeling, and it can be caused by lots of things, it can be caused by an alcoholic drink wearing off, but there's lots and lots of reasons why we humans feel tense, tense and anxious, you know, an argument with a partner, a bill that you can't pay, a bad day at work, whatever. Over the years, as you consume alcohol more and more, your brain starts to link that, that, that reaction. So whenever you feel tense and nervous, either because the last drink is wearing off and it's caused by that chemical reaction or because there's stresses and strains of everyday life, your brain immediately jumps in and says, oh, I know how to get rid of that. Let's have an alcoholic drink. That's learned behavior, but it becomes very, very deeply embedded in us. And the problem is your subconscious only works by immediate cause and effect. So what your brain is doing, it's just think, it's just looking at the situation and saying, okay, I feel tense and nervous. I know how to get rid of that. I have an alcoholic drink. What it doesn't do is look at the overall picture and think that actually 15, 20 minutes after that drink, I see this increasing anxiety. It stops me sleeping. It has all these negative effects. Your subconscious literally is just immediate cause and effect. So this very powerful part of your brain is constantly triggering you to reach for a drink, reach for a drink, reach for a drink, despite the fact that you rationally know all these thousands of reasons why you shouldn't do so. Yeah, so the immediate effect is positive, and that's all that matters for that subconscious kind of habit, habitual loop. It says, hey, yeah. when, we, when we drink this, immediately we feel a little bit relaxed, there's less anxiety, there's maybe a little bit of feeling of euphoria, and that's all that it cares about. It has no way of taking into consideration the hangover, the anxiety, the ruining of career and family or whatever the other consequences might be. Those are effectively irrelevant in terms of the subconscious perception of alcohol. And it reminds me, of, I mean, we talk about this in the context of habits. Almost all bad habits suffer from this. They have an immediate reward and long-term consequence. That's why it's so much easier to pick up a bad habit than it is a good habit. It's just the way that, you know, that the chemistry of our brains works. And then good habits tend to have little to no immediate reward. Like if you think about the classic apple a day, but mm -hmm. they've got long-term benefits and that's why um, there's such a pain. There's a little bit of, of cognitive hacking that that needs to happen it's an interesting one because i was thinking of this the other day so, so say you have an alcoholic drink you get maybe 15 minutes 10 minutes of the you know the so-called pleasurable effect of it then it le wears off leaving that f feeling of anxiety and that anxiety can hang on for like 24 hours afterwards the other important thing it does is ruin our sleep so you're getting a very very short period of inverted commas pleasure followed by hours a day or so of feeling well under par. Whereas if you compare it with something like exercise, it's the other way around. When you're doing it, it may feel unpleasant. You have to push yourself. But when you're done, you feel good. It releases endorphins, you're fitter, and you feel better for hours and hours afterwards. So although when you look at it rationally, I can either have 15 minutes of pleasure followed by 24 hours of feeling rubbish, or I can have 15 minutes of pain followed by 24 hours of feeling great. It's no contest, but when you when you allow that irrational part of your brain to jump in and make the decision, before you know it, you're sat there drinking a beer instead of going out for a run. Yeah, it reminds me. There's this Seinfeld episode where the main character Jerry, for those who don't know it, he says something that basically like nighttime Jerry doesn't care about morning Jerry. <laughs> like nighttime Jerry's having a great time, and who cares? Morning Jerry will have to deal with you know will have to deal with yeah. it. It's morning Jerry's problem, you know, and that's exactly what we're doing when we go yeah, out. Yeah. We're like, oh yeah, that's, that's tomorrow. Brent will have to worry about this, but we're having a good time. We're not going to have to deal with this. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, and so can you speak to that? I mean, I think it's a, it's a common misconception, although I think people are a little bit more educated on this than they were a few years ago, but I think people will say, you know what, just that glass of wine or whatever, it helps me sleep can you speak to the misconception of alcohol as sleep aid yeah yeah absolutely so so the, the, there's two parts to that there's there's the part about what alcohol actually does to our sleep so alcohol absolutely demolishes your ability to sleep a lot of people think that 
sleep is about drop onto the bed, fall unconscious for a few hours and you're good to go. It's, it's far more complicated than that. You have to go through specific sleep cycles in order to feel refreshed and ready to go. So there's different sleep cycles. So there's something called deep sleep, whereas as you'd expect, you're very deeply unconscious. But there's another sleep cycle called REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement. And the reason it's called rapid eye movement is when they monitor people in REM sleep, their, their eyes flicker. Um, when they've attached sensors to people and monitored them in REM sleep, their brain lights up almost as if they're fully awake. It's where we dream. So it's this odd sleep cycle, but it's where we're almost fully awake when we go into it. Now, because alcohol is a sedative, it stops you being able to get into that REM sleep because you have to be almost awake to do it and being sedated stops you from doing it. So when you drink alcohol, you massively reduce the amount of REM sleep you can get. Now, they've done tests with rats where they've starved them of REM sleep and they've actually been dead within a few weeks. Um, they've done voluntary studies with humans. It sounds like really good fun. You go into a sleep center, they attach sensors to you, and you fall asleep. And as soon as you go into REM sleep, they wake you up. So they stop you going into REM sleep and people become very dis disorientated, very depressed. Their mental health suffers massively. So there's a lot we don't know about dreaming and, and REM sleep, but we do know it's absolutely essential for feeling good and waking up feeling rested. So when you drink alcohol, you massively reduce your body's ability, your brain's ability to get into REM sleep. So although alcohol may knock you out, it's not allowing you to sleep properly. I don't know if you've read Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Yes, yes. I when he talks about alcohol and sleep, he doesn't even call what we go into after we've been drinking alcohol as sleep. He just says alcohol, it, it's, it, how does he put it? It, um, it sedates you out of consciousness, but it doesn't actually put you into anything that we recognize as normal sleep cycles. So when you're drinking alcohol, you're dropping unconscious but you're not going through anything remotely like a normal sleep cycle, which is why the biggest reported symptom of a hangover is tiredness, because you physically cannot sleep properly. And unfortunately, it's as true for one drink as many. So even, you know, the so-called one glass of wine is good for you. It isn't even that massively interrupts your sleep cycle. And of course, don't forget when you drink alcohol, it wears off leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety. So if you're having a couple of glasses of wine, it wears off after about five hours. And it, as I say, it's the equivalent of drinking too much coffee. You know, when you have too much caffeine and you feel really anxious, drinking alcohol for sleep. I quite often say this to people. Imagine you need eight hours sleep. You go to bed at 11 and you wake up at seven. Okay. And that's you at your very best. Drinking alcohol is like setting an alarm for three or four in the morning, waking up and drinking a couple of massive drugs, uh, jugs of strong black coffee and just lying there twitching and unable to sleep for the rest of the night. That's what you're doing when you drink alcohol. But the problem is, and now I'll talk about the second part of it. So where, for example, I don't drink alcohol. So when I get towards bedtime, my brain naturally starts to close things down. I feel sleepy and eventually drift into a hopefully restorative sleep. And that's why we're told so much about good sleep hygiene. It's just, you know, like, don't have white light, dim the lights, read a book, you know, whatever it is. It's just sending that message to your brain that it's bedtime soon, so start closing things down. The problem is when you drink alcohol in the evening, which is a sedative, your brain stops going through that process. So your brain doesn't bother shutting things down because it knows there's a nightly dose of this very powerful sedative coming in that closes your brain down for it. So that's what people find. If they're drinking regularly, and you're often told, well, you should have a night off drinking like once or twice a week, so they cut out the alcohol, they don't drink one evening, they find it incredibly difficult to sleep. And that's why it's because their brain isn't used to going through this shutting down process. It's just relying on the alcohol. If they actually stop drinking for a few nights, their brain would pick up the slack again and go back through that process. But the problem is their perception is I cannot sleep unless I have alcohol because they drink regularly and they can sleep they can fall asleep, certainly. But as soon as they have a night off, they find it incredibly difficult to sleep. And again, it's the same dynamic. Alcohol isn't actually giving them anything. It's taking away their ability to do something, in this case, fall asleep naturally, and then restoring it only if they have alcohol. So between these two things, it creates this, this really unpleasant thing because people are convinced that alcohol helps them sleep, but it's actually doing the exact office opposite. It's actually destroying their ability to sleep. But their test, you know, they'll say, hey, I had a I had a night where I didn't drink and I slept 
worse because the alcohol is actually making it maybe a little bit easier to fall asleep. It's destroying the night of sleep, even though the like lay on the pillow and I don't know, go unconscious might be slightly more straightforward. And then because their brain is used to that, they're like, Hey, I took a night off and I I need the alcohol. And it's like, no, you need to take a few nights off Mm -hmm. for your, for your brain to adjust back and, and, get back to normal where it wasn't removing the the compensation it was like hey the alcohol is doing the job so we don't need to do it and now you got to get back to normal the other thing i think that's interesting is the cycle that happens the next day and so you know i think this is for me at least i can think about like the saturday to sunday cycle which is like okay a little bit too much to drink on saturday night and then that follows with poor sleep And then the next day I'm tired and I'm a little anxious and maybe I'm a little moody. And on Sunday nights, I don't do this anymore, but when I did this, like that glass of red wine was really good. Like I kind of didn't feel normal again until I had that glass of red wine. And I think one thing that's counterintuitive that maybe you can speak to in like the, okay, the impacts the next day and how that can lead back into drinking is, while drinking is a sedative and a depressant kind of get your energy back with that glass of red wine the next night after the night of drinking like i just feel a little normal the mood comes back and so there's an energy increase i think that happens with that first glass of wine so can you speak to like the effect of being a little bit tired and and hung over the next day yeah yeah absolutely so so there's there's two parts to this one alcohol is a sedative, so if you're feeling tired, it will take the edge off it. But there's a there's a much more important one here, and this is how we act when we're not feeling right. Okay, so we humans, and, and in fact any animal, when we're feeling ill, the natural tendency is for our energy to massively reduce. Okay, and and you know that that's just common sense. It's just evolution. You know, if an animal is ill or injured, it needs to hide away and rest to give it bo- its body a chance to get back on top of things. Whereas if we're feeling well and healthy, you know, we quite often feel energetic and we want to go and do things. Now, I noticed, I don't know if you've got, ki- or you, you, you've got a young daughter, haven't you? I don't know if she, what I find with my sons is they're so, so they're slightly older than your daughter, they're 10 and 12. But if they're not well, they're really sluggish. They don't want to do anything. So, so over here, we've got something called cowpaw. It's just paracetamol, but in a syrup form. So you give them the, the paracetamol and they're really tired. They're not well. And then you give them this and they start bouncing off the walls. They're running around going absolutely berserk. Now, what's happening there is they're ill. So their body is saying to them, stop, rest, don't move, making them feel really lethargic. But as soon as you give them this mild anesthetic, it takes the edge off that. And because they then feel better, it gives them the burst of energy. Now, what happens when you drink alcohol, you're robbing yourself of sleep, you're taking a poison and you're interrupting your brain chemistry. So the next day you don't feel good. So your brain, your body is going into that survival mode. It's going to that hide away, don't do anything, rest so that we can recover and get better. When you take that alcoholic drink, it's anesthetizing the feelings of sickness or headache you've got. It's correcting the brain chemistry. Um, it's and like I say, it's anesthetizing the tiredness and suddenly you feel a whole lot better. Now, with that feeling better comes that burst of energy, because like I say, when, when a human and an animal, anything feels well and healthy, it's energetic. When it feels ill, it's lethargic, even though it's counterintuitive to think, well, hang on, am I taking a sedative? Why is it making me energetic? It's because it has made you feel ill in the first place. So you don't feel right. So a lot of people get confused about this because they think that alcohol is actually a stimulant. It isn't and it can never be. Chemically, it is a sedative, but it can affect us as a stimulant can in that situation. Yeah, so it's exactly the thing that kind of caused the tiredness and the anxiety in the first place. The unfortunate nature of this cycle is that's the cure in some, in some cases, I mean, it's, it's the short-term cure. It exacerbates the problem switching a little bit. Maybe if we, if we dial back in the cycle to our Saturday night, can you speak to, to somebody who might say, look, alcohol is a really good social lubricant for me. I really enjoy social situations much more with alcohol. Like, can you speak to the, I think the myth that alcohol is some, is some great social lubricant. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
there's a simple fact. So, so, so I'm sure you've heard about endorphins. It's a chemical that your brain releases that makes you feel really good. Now, we get an endorphin rush when we do lots of things. Um, I kind of think of it as sort of like a survival of the species sort of thing because we get it when we're doing something either good for us or good for the species. So we get an endorphin hit if we have a healthy meal when we're hungry. We get an endorphin hit if we have sex. We get an endorphin hit if we exercise. So it's all of these things we do that we get an endorphin hit. One of the interesting things is we get an endorphin hit when we are relaxed and socializing with people, which I think is is a very interesting thought to think that humans are actually designed, created in such a way or evolved in such a way that we're supposed to communicate with each other. We're supposed to share ideas and emotions and all the rest of it. But be that as it may, if we are relaxed and talking to people, socializing, we get that endorphin hit, we start to feel really good, okay? But we're all products of society, okay? And some of us more than others, but most people, when they go into a social situation, will feel slightly nervous to start with because, you know, you're worried about what you look like. You might say something stupid. You don't know people. What will I talk about? You know, some people more than others, some people are very extroverted and they're straight in there. Most people, to a degree, have some kind of social anxiety. So you have this dynamic where you're going into a social situation feeling slightly nervous, but if you relax and start to enjoy the conversation, you really start to enjoy yourself because you get that endorphin hit, okay? Now, what happens when you introduce alcohol? You're going into the situation feeling nervous. You have an alcoholic drink, and it anesthetizes those feelings of anxiety. So you start to relax a lot quicker and therefore your brain releases the endorphins quicker. But this is one of the very interesting things, and it goes back to what I'm talking about earlier. When we start drinking, it's usually in social situations. What we think of this wonderful feeling we get from alcohol isn't an alcohol buzz at all. It's an alcohol plus endorphin buzz, okay? It's a very different experience, and this is why if people are drinking... I encourage them to try drinking. You know, we're usually told don't drink on your own. It's not a good sign. But actually to sit down with no friends, no TV, no music, no nothing, and to drink an alcoholic drink and just feel what it feels like on its own is a very different experience to drinking socializing. So what normally happens, so to go back to the dynamic of socializing anyway, we have the alcoholic drink. It makes us relax quicker. We get that endorphin rush. Now, in fact... It actually takes from your evening because when you're drinking, as I've already touched on, the alcohol wears off, leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety. So when you're out socializing, you need to keep drinking to keep that anxious feeling away. And as you're doing that, you're becoming increasingly numbed and intoxicated. So whereas if you go out without drinking, it might take you a bit longer to get that endorphin buzz. But when you get it, you enjoy it for the entire evening. What you normally find when you're drinking is... You get that feel-good feeling to begin with, but as you're constantly drinking throughout the evening, it starts to numb it. And it's a very interesting thing. If you go out as a non-drinker and watch people drinking, you'll invariably find this dynamic. You'll find that the drinkers become very animated and chatty and happy at the start of the evening. But as it wears on, that mood dips quite rapidly. And that's why towards the end of the evening, you get the tears, sometimes arguments, all the rest of it. So that's basically what the dynamic is there. Yeah, I think that you you outline it really well where, okay, you have a couple of drinks and you feel you feel good. You're feeling the effects of two drinks and then those start to wear off. So you need two more drinks to get back to that like two drink feeling. But you're now four drinks intoxicated. Then those two wear off. You need another two. Okay, you're still at that feeling of two drinks, but now you're six drinks intoxicated. And that really, I mean, it's it's said really simply and it really resonates with me. And I had an experience just this weekend. So I'm in Boulder, Colorado. And this is probably not international news, but we've got this football team here that's a very exciting national, like it's this big, exciting thing. And we were the worst team in the league last year and now we're like one of the best. We've got this flashy coach and there was an 8 PM game that I, that we went to and it was a really exciting game and it went until like one in the morning and we didn't, my wife and I didn't, we didn't, we didn't drink and we're leaving and people are like, it's almost like if you like took a movie and slowed it down, like, wow, can't you believe, you know, they're like very kind of slowed down and their eyes are all glassy. 
I just had this moment. It reminded me of your work where I'm like, there's no way they're having more fun than we had, <laughs> you know, no, no, no. they're just it's, they're yeah. dragging and they're like all slowed. And, and so it is interesting to go out for, cause I don't do it very often, like a full night where I'm still out mm. at one in the morning, but I haven't had a single drink and you observe people, you know, they're not as interesting as they think they are. Actually, they kind of, they look foolish at that point. Um, and I was that person many times. I don't, I don't mean to judge, but it's really stark. It was really at the end of that football game. I just thought, oh, that does, I'm so glad I'm not in that place right now. It's interesting, isn't it? Because they, above all, the thing that strikes me is they, they, they're not enjoying themselves particularly. You know, a lot of the time they're, they're too intoxicated to really know what's going on. But the funny thing is their memory of it the next day is the bit they remember is the first bit when they were relaxing and really enjoying it. The rest of it's a bit blurry. So they kind of assume, oh, well, I enjoyed the first bit. I must have enjoyed the entire night. But it's not the case at all. And that's why I think it's incredibly powerful. If you're, if you're thinking about not drinking, go out and watch drinkers because we have this idea that when you drink, you have a really good night all night. It, it's not the case at all. Yeah, and I really like this. Hey, social situations, they produce endorphins. So you're kind of mistaking that feeling with the alcohol. You're misattributing that feeling to the alcohol. And so maybe it helps you get there a little bit more quickly. It makes it a little bit easier to transition into this group setting, but ultimately it's a numbing agent. Like if, you mm. know, if there are feelings of pleasure that are happening and happening in the social situation, just by definition, you are reducing those feelings of pleasure with alcohol. That's just the nature of, um, of the chemical. What do you, what do you say to people who say, you know what, I understand all of that, but I just really like the taste of alcohol, you know, a really good glass of wine with the right meal for me, you know, it's a culinary experience. It's about the taste. What's the, where, where are those people maybe misunderstanding alcohol and the flavor of alcohol? So, so, so alcohol as a chemical is repugnant to human beings. And that's not, that's not a question of taste. That's true for everyone. There's no one that can sniff neat alcohol without their eyes watering and without shying away from it. If you try and taste neat alcohol, it, it will make you vomit. You will wretch. It's absolutely foul. The only way we can take the drug is by diluting it in water and adding an awful lot of refined sugar to it. Um, and that's basically what you end up with wine and beer. Now, going back to a point about the subconscious, now, nobody, when they first drink alcohol, likes the taste of it. You know, if you see youngsters drinking, it's foul. And I certainly remember the first time I tried beer or wine, it's just like, oh, that, it's absolutely horrible. But you kind of persevere with it. It's a very interesting thing. Sometimes it's easier to think of with smoking and vaping. Okay, so when you smoke or vape with nicotine in it, there's this, if, similar to alcohol, but obviously the other end of the scale, it's a stimulant rather than a sedative. So what happens is a lot of people, when they first smoke or even vape, they cough, okay? And that's their body's natural reaction to breathing in a poisonous um, gas is to cough. It's your body forcibly exhaling what is in the lungs as quickly as possible. But what happens after, immediately after that is quite interesting because some of the nicotine from the smoke will have got into the lungs and it will have hit the bloodstream. And the immediate result of that is we feel more alert and awake. So again, the subconscious does that very narrow perception. Well, what's happened here? Okay, we breathed in some smoke or vape that we thought was poisonous, but actually we feel pretty good for it because we now feel quite alert and awake. So the next time you go and do it, the body won't kick in with the cough mechanism because it starts to perceive the inhaling of smoke as a good thing or the inhaling of vape as a good thing because it make, makes you feel immediately better. That's what happens with alcohol. It's the same with taste. We can adapt our taste to different things. People often talk about, you know, an acquired taste. All an acquired taste is if you persevere with something long enough and your body gets a perceived benefit from it, you will start to get used to and eventually enjoy that taste. So again, that's a basic survival mechanism. There aren't many creatures on the planet whose food supply is safe enough that they might not at some point have to adapt to another food type. And that's, you know, that, that's a basic thing. We have hunger. So the more hungry you get, the more desperate you are. And eventually you'll eat anything. You'll experiment with different things. Now, if you eat something that may taste foul, but actually it does have some nutritional value, 
immediately afterwards, you'll start to feel slightly better. So your brain has this thing where if you consume something and you feel good for it, you'll start to change your belief or change your perception of that taste. And that's what happens with alcohol. You know, I've already talked about how it creates that feeling of anxiety. You have another one and it relieves that feeling of anxiety. So that's how your brain starts to approach. You start to think, well, hang on, this glass of wine, for example, that I thought was foul actually makes me feel a lot better. Therefore, there's nutritional value in it. Therefore, I'll change my perception of it. Because it's an interesting thing. We often say to children, you know, your taste buds change over time. Nobody's taste buds change. Taste is a chemical reaction between the food and receptors in your tongue. Nothing changes. The only thing that can change is how your brain interprets that. It reminds me, there was a, um, I think this is a tweet. There's a guy named Oren Hoffman who is an who's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but he tweeted something to, to the extent of like, wine is the ultimate long con. And it really makes me wonder if like the fine wine industry, and it's hard to say, cause I've had these enjoyable tasting dinners and like, you know, I've got people in my life who I love and respect who really, who really love wine, but it really makes me wonder like, is it all bullshit? Like, is it, is it, it's this story and there's, you know, so you're telling the story about the wine and the brand and, and the way in which it pairs with the food and then you're drinking the wine and you're getting this immediate, this positive benefit from, from the wine. But ultimately at the end of the day, like it's all bullshit. It's just like somebody mixed that. They took some grape juice. They fermented it to give you that feeling. They, you know, they made it in such a way that they've masked the taste of the alcohol. Yeah, yeah. And not only have they masked it just in terms of like what you're putting in your mouth, but they're masking it with this elaborate story of where it came from and, you know, the vines and what the temperature was and how the season was. And, you know, I, I wonder if we just wipe all that way and it's like, actually, it's just, it's all total bullshit. I'm sure you could get a different flavor from different types of amphetamine if you, if you wanted to. It wouldn't necessarily be something you want to indulge in too often, though. And then what about this notion that, look, I, um, life is hard. I've, you know, something has happened in my life that's really diff difficult or something happened to me as a child. And... You know, I just, I struggle to cope with that. Like for me, alcohol is a good way to just get away from that for a few moments. It's really nice. I'm going through a hard time. And, you know, for me, alcohol is actually helpful for that. What, what's the response to that? What, the, what we need to remember is with alcohol, it creates a feeling of sedation followed by a feeling of anxiety, okay? So if you've got a problem that's this big and you have a drink, it goes to this big, but when it wears off, it's this big, okay? And for people who are listening, I, like, I'm, I'm moving my hands here, but you, your problem is a certain size. You drink alcohol and it shrinks, and then when it wears off, it doubles and quadruples. There's lots and lots of ways you can deal, you know, whether it's trauma, mental health issues, there's lots and lots of ways you, you, know, you, you can seek therapy you can take medication and i'm talking about you know properly prescribed medication you can go to cbt there's lots and lots of options alcohol and drugs as options should be right down the bottom of the scale because one there's that dynamic where although it has the immediate effect of seemingly shrinking the problem it then exacerbates it massively when it wears off and of course the other massive thing we've just talked about is how Im alcohol impacts sleep and the knock on effect on your mental health for that alone is massive. So if you have got something that you are grappling with, the absolute worst, one of the worst things you can possibly do is, is destroy your ability to get natural and restorative sleep. You're doing yourself a massive disfavor with it. You, you may find it's immediately helpful. But my very strong advice would be find another way of managing it because, as I say, alcohol and other drugs should be way down the bottom of the list of options for you. They're only going to make it worse. And it seems there's probably some delay in the processing of the issue that, you know, there's some certain amount of sober, like, acceptance and understanding and, you know, just kind of like, cognitively dealing with whatever the problem is and that 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 process is paused 
when you're using and so you're like delaying the time to kind of getting through the the processing of the issue but in any case you're never you're not going to find any uh psychologist or therapist or psychiatrist who's going to say hey you know for your particular circumstances i think alcohol is going to be pretty helpful for you and yeah in there's, of- there's, there's an interesting dynamic here where you find people who are going through the grieving process so there, there is a very specific and recognized psychological process that you go through with grieving. And obviously, it's the extent of it is different from individual to individual, but the actual mechanics of it remains the same. Um, and it can take longer or less time, depending on how the person's affected and all the rest of it. But what you find is when they drink alcohol, they never go through that process because in preventing themselves being able to sleep, which is when your brain assimilates and um, absorbs a lot of information and experiences, and just through anesthetizing through it, you actually stop yourself being able to go through the process. So although, you know, if you lose someone very close to you, life is never quite the same without them, but you eventually get to a point of acceptance and being able to get on with your life. When people drink, they never get there. It's as raw today as it was four years ago. And, and that is not natural. That's not a healthy thing to do at all. You're actually elongating the entire thing and stopping yourself being able to get to come to terms with it. And what about the opposite end of the spectrum, which is, look, for me, alcohol, it's its a reward that I give myself. I work really hard, you know, all week long, I'm working, I'm with my family, I'm with the kids or whatever, I'm exercising, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. And Friday night is when I, I give myself, I allow myself to have that wine and relax. And it's really, it's really a reward for, you know, working so hard during the week. What's what's the response to that? So so I, I do a similar thing because I work very hard all week and I've got a young family. Um, and for me, a reward should be something enjoyable and pleasant. It wouldn't be something that would make me feel slightly sedated and then wearing off, leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety. It certainly wouldn't be something that completely demolished my light's sleep. So no matter how long I was in bed for, I'd be tired and lethargic the whole next next day. That to me seems a bit ridiculous. So it may be something you do, but I don't, I wouldn't see it as a reward. I would see that as a punishment. And I think that goes back to treating alcohol with a bit more realism rather than putting it on this pedestal that we have. If you think that drinking a class one carcinogen with mixed with a load of refined sugar is a reward, then I would say to rethink that for me, sitting down at the end of the day, relaxing is a reward. It's an incredibly pleasurable thing. I open a book, I maybe watch some TV, play a game or something, but taking a chemical that actually makes you feel a lot worse overall, just to me is not a reward. It goes back to this issue of it feels nice at first. I, I get it at 5.30 PM on Friday, halfway through that, that first glass, um, it feels good, but the ROI is not positive. William, your book, Alcohol Explained, is excellent. We haven't, um, you know, kind of even really scratched the surface of the fullness of the book. And so I would encourage um, anyone who's interested to pick it up. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've, I'm, I'm very deep on this and I loved the book. And I think it's also a really helpful approach for the full spectrum of drinkers, meaning if you're somebody who feels like I, I like I, you know, you know, in your core, I feel like I need to stop and stop permanently. I think there's a really nice place for this book there, but also just for reducing some of the brainwashing. If you're somebody who just wants to moderate or just wants to be healthier and doesn't feel like it's ruining your life, I think having an honest view of what is it, what is it not, and kind of dispelling some of these misconceptions can be really helpful in just having a much healthier relationship with it. Because I I don't think that abstinence is for everybody. Our culture makes it difficult. But I think the book is awesome um, for people in either camp. And so Thank you for coming on and thank you for writing the book. And oh, no, thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Brent. The Most Day Show is recorded in Boulder, Colorado, produced by Patrick Godino, music by Patrick Lee, and hosted by yours truly, Brent Franson, founder and CEO of Most Days. 